And now, stand-up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe, it's time to Stand Up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, will charging my backyard power tool battery take longer than a therapy session? And with actor Jason Momoa denying rumors of dating Kate Beckinsale, will Kate respond to my tagging her in my totally not creepy Instagram posts? And now, the podcast host who would never go full creepy on social media unless he's being paid handsomely, Pete Dominic! That's right, Pico. Thank you, as always, for another bizarre, hilarious, amazing introduction. And you're making me think about maybe one of... I think the creepiest thing I've done on social media, along those lines in terms of maybe saying something inappropriate to to a woman. I think you really I, I didn't hear anything from her, but I watched the college women's volleyball championship and I wasn't just watching it because they were attractive college female athletes, though I'm not lying, it didn't hurt. I was watching because my daughter started playing volleyball and I was trying to get her to watch it with me. Anyway, I watched a little bit of the championship game and then I went on Instagram and DM'd one of them, great game. And I don't know why I didn't just uh, mention it in her. I guess she hadn't posted anything about it yet. It had just ended. And I remember feeling I shouldn't have DM'd a college athlete. And then I remember thinking I shouldn't have opened the show this way, but I did. I improv and that's what happens. Now that I've liberated that truth, if we can move past it, I'm very excited to tell you that joining me today for the first time on the podcast is both these guests. I've got Stephen Greenhouse, who is a longtime reporter, economics reporter, worked at the New York Times for years. He's had over three decade career. He's an author of a couple of books and very few people have covered the labor movement as well as and as long as Stephen Greenhouse. He joins me to talk about the huge win for Amazon workers at a Staten Island warehouse and what it means for the labor movement today. Also joining me for the first time, Professor Omakongo Dibinja joins me from American University. He's a writer and internationally respected speaker at this point, an expert in diversity, equity and inclusion, race and politics and professor of intercultural communication. We had a wonderful conversation last week. I'm very excited to welcome him into onto the podcast for the first time. So two great guests joining me. And I've got you, most importantly, and I cannot do the show without your support. So thank you very much. A shout out to Mindy Cunningham and her family who are listening to the show while they are on vacation in the Emerald Isle. I hope everything is going okay. Mindy, thanks for the vitamin N shots. I'm going to start giving more shout outs to listeners. I have such, I have so much correspondence with so many of you. It's fun to drop little nugget nuggets in to let each other know that there's so many unique, wonderful humans that are part of our listening community. Of course, you can always join us on the Thursday night hangouts. So sign up now, stand up with Pete.com. All right. Doing good. Ava was inducted into the National Honor Society last night, which you have to have uh, do community service and you've got to get really good grades. And I just never saw a child of mine anywhere near the honor roll. I mean, I did make honor roll in middle school, by the way. It was high school that I really stopped caring about academics and started caring about getting laughs. Never missed a day of school, sports, girls, all my mates, as they say down under. School wasn't, it just wasn't my stuff, my thing. Academics, sitting in class and learning that way and taking tests. I like to learn this way, the way I have been hosting this podcast, reading and researching things that I'm interested in. And then, and then going out and booking the, the, the guests, the experts, the authors, the journalists, the scientists and so on. And so that's how we learn each and every day here. I like to think I'm, uh, I guess, an autodidact, you know, self, self learner. But from all the great experts and listeners that I have joining me. But my daughter somehow fit in in the school model and it was real cool. And it felt great to see all these young people grown up here that we've grown up with in, in this community. Speaking of which, working hard to get our candidates elected at the Board of Education. If you are doing that in your community, let me know. Share with me the ideas that are working for you in terms of organization and voter turnout and campaigning and all of that. And if you aren't. Why aren't you? 
involved in your local community's board of education. That is ground zero. Just to let you know, even though if you're not doing anything, if you're not involved in any possible way, I want you to know, you know who is? Steve Bannon. Yeah, so you're going to have to deal with that one. Hopefully you can get involved, and, and I'd love to hear what your ideas if you have issues with your board of education. Always a good place to start. And speaking of starting, let's get to the news, shall we? I've got a whole bunch to talk with you and play for you from yesterday's news. Here's what happened the day before. Ladies and gentlemen, the last 24. I think you guys should record that raid. Who who else wants to add a little jingle? Give me a line to introduce the last 24 and I'll use it. Okay. Do you remember what you were doing when you found out that Joe Biden, in fact, it was official that he'd won the election? Uh, It was November 8th, 2020. The election was on the 3rd, but there was like four or five days there where there was a lot of concern and, and confusion. I remember that day. It's a glorious day. And I was I think about it often because we, we won. We we beat this evil, horrible, terrible person, Donald Trump. And the long national nightmare was kind of over. Then, of course, we had the insurrection. And here we are today after covid and so on. But yesterday, the former president not the disgraced one, President Obama. Remember him? Well, he visited the White House with the current president, of course, his former vice president. And they were there for an event marking the 12th anniversary of the signature piece of legislation that he got passed, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, his signature health care law. And a flaw in the Affordable Care Act was being addressed by the Biden administration because the White House announced a fix for the ACA's family glitch, which comes from the current interpretation of the ACA's eligibility criteria from the Treasury Department. So they took care of that, but they they reminisced. They got together. Uh, President Biden proposed uh, these changes to the Affordable Care Act to extend subsidies for families. But it was really cool to see President Obama standing there in the White House. At least it was to me. And he opened with a with a pretty funny joke. Thank you, Vice President Biden, Vice President. That was a joke. That was all set up. There you go. That was fun. And Biden kind of saluted him and. Kamala Harris stood there uh, between them, and it was a nice scene. Well, President Obama then got serious, of course, and and made these comments about why he was proud of what they accomplished and that it was a huge part of his public service to the country. And as I said to our dear friend, Harry Reid, who uh, is missed, wished he was here today because he took great pride in what we did. I intended to get health care passed, even if it cost me re-election, which for a while looked like it might. Uh, <laughs> but for all of us, for Joe, for Harry, for Nancy Pelosi, for others, the ACA was an example of why you run for office in the first place, why all of you sign up for doing jobs that pay you less than you could make someplace else. Why you're away from home sometimes and you miss some soccer practices or some dance recitals. Because we don't we're not supposed to do this just to occupy a seat or to hang on to power. But we're supposed to do this because it's making a difference in the lives of the people who sent us here. Well, you can tell I'm a fan of President Barack Obama. And I thought that was a nice little soundbite. I couldn't find this any any good sound or clips of Biden or, or Kamala Harris. And I looked. I will just read to you what the president tweeted. The the good president tweeting, by the way, he wrote that once today's proposed rule is finalized, President Biden said on Twitter yesterday, that starting next year, working families will Get the help they need to afford full family coverage. As a result, those families will save hundreds of dollars a month 
and an estimated 200,000 currently uninsured Americans will gain coverage. Then he said, instead of destroying the Affordable Care Act, let's keep building on it. Extend the American Rescue Plan subsidies that are lowering premiums and expanding coverage. Close the Medicaid coverage gap. Lower prescription drug prices. We can do this. But if congressional Republicans have their way, 100 million Americans will, with a pre-existing condition, will once again be able to be denied health care coverage by insurance companies. We need to keep up the fight. In America, health care should be a right, not a privilege. That's President Biden tweeting yesterday. And I just always have to say, I don't know where my family would be without the Affordable Care Act. Seriously, my wife is an independent contractor. I'm an independent contractor. And the only way to get affordable health insurance for our family, and it's not a high quality policy, but was the Affordable Care Act's exchanges that were created for my wife and I. And then uh, my, my daughters in New York State get to be covered by a very affordable children's health plan. Again, not the best, not a gold plan, but at least it's something. And it was not there before the Affordable Care Act was. So I'm always very grateful for that and appreciated seeing President Biden and President Obama together again yesterday, as did so many of you, I'm sure. All right, let's stay at the White House. The White House briefing yesterday, Jen Psaki taking questions from a reporter as to why the amazing economic numbers in terms of job numbers are not extending to public opinion, public approval of the Biden administration. She doesn't really offer an answer, which I think was was smart here, because it's not Joe Biden's fault that things cost more. And it's an issue in every country in the world. So here is that moment yesterday's briefing. Go ahead, George. Uh, Yeah, there was a recent poll that showed more people think jobs were lost in the last year than think uh, jobs were gained. Uh, Why is that? And is there anything that you can do to change that perception? Well, I saw that poll um, or saw that data. Um, What I can tell you, uh, what we can do from here is share the facts. And I know all of you are working to share facts as well, even as you ask us tough questions and hold us accountable and to account as well. We know the fact is that the president created more jobs last year than any year in American history. Uh, That is a very simple fact that I probably cannot say enough from here. And our allies and partners cannot say enough out there in the country. Um, And we will just continue, have to continue to work at it. belief out there. I can't make a clear assessment of that, George. You know, I know that obviously people across the country, we know and we see this in data and polling, are still feeling the impact of COVID. Their lives are not entirely back to normal. Uh, They're seeing some, uh, you know, restrictions to their daily living, which is frustrating. Uh, Obviously, the impact of the cost of items, whether it's the price of gas that has a range of factors that have led to it, specifically the invasion of Ukraine most recently, uh, those impact how people feel. We see that in consumer confidence. So I I can't assess what is in the brain of every American, uh, but I can tell you what the facts are and tell you that we also recognize that there are areas, including bringing down costs, will continue to work out. Ebony, go ahead. All right. And let me get one more question here. This is uh, CBS News, Stephen Portnoy, who got a lot of criticism on social media yesterday for asking this question. And I should say CBS Radio news reporter Stephen Porto, also the president of the White House Correspondents Association, apparently, he asks a lot of what I would describe as asinine questions. I don't like when reporters have access to power like this and they ask questions that seem to be begging for a war. At least that's what I hear. Maybe you hear it differently. Here it is. Just to put a finer point on some of the questions you've so far been asked, why shouldn't the images of the atrocities from Bucha compel a worldwide, unified, coalition, kinetic response? You mean a military war? Tell me more about what you mean. Sure, a, a military response led by the United States and the international partners. As in bringing military troops on the ground from the United States and NATO. Well, the president has described outrageous things. You've called them atrocities. You've said perhaps we should brace ourselves for worse. Why not? I think what the president's uh, objective is and his responsibility is to make decisions that are in the interest of the United States and the national security of the United States uh, and the American people. And that is not to go to war with Russia. It is to do everything in our power uh, to hold them accountable, to support efforts through international systems to do exactly that, and to provide military assistance, security assistance, and support to the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian government. That's exactly what we're doing. But it is not in our interests or in the interests of the American people for us to be in a war with Russia. 
I mean, am I right? Did you did that question hit you the way it hit me? I thought that was very irresponsible, but well handled by Jen Psaki, making no mistake about what the United States of America's intentions are in in the region right now. All right, well, let's stay in Washington and Capitol Hill specifically, where we had the Army General Mark Milley, he's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, also the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, were both testifying before the House Armed Services Committee on their 2023 budget proposal. Of course, a lot of the focus in the hearing was uh, on the uh, Russia's invasion in Ukraine, the war crimes being committed. Here first is a little bit from a sobering clip from Mark Milley yesterday. We are witness to the greatest threat to peace and security of Europe and perhaps the world in my 42 years of service in uniform. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is threatening to undermine not only European peace and stability, but global peace and stability that my parents and a generation of Americans fought so hard to defend. All right, that's uh, Joint Chiefs Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mark Milley. But what got most of the attention, most of the headlines on social media and elsewhere was the congressman from, from Florida, Matt Gates, who you're probably familiar with his work. I mean, he's a real pissant. He really gave it to the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. And, of course, Lloyd Austin gave it right back to him in this, I think, fair to say, tense moment. This is triggering. It's hard to hear a guy like Matt Gates talk to a guy like Lloyd Austin this way, especially with his dumb, horrifically stupid point. There's so much to criticize about the defense, the military budget, and how we spend money. And none of it, absolutely none of it, has to do with, quote, wokeism, whatever the hell that means when it comes to defense spending. You guys said that that Russia would overrun Ukraine in 36 days. You said that the Taliban would be kept at bay for months. You totally blew those calls. And maybe we would be better at them if the National Defense University actually worked a little more on strategy and a little less on wokeism. Has it occurred to you that Russia has not overrun Ukraine because of what we've done? And our allies have done. But that was have, baked have into your flawed assessment. That? that was baked into your flawed assessment. And so yeah, I saw that the Obama administration the, the that we tried to destroy our military by starving it of resources. And it seems the Biden administration is trying to destroy our military by force feeding it wokeism. I yield back. I mean, I, I'm not sure how to analyze that or react to it other than Matt Gates cares about Matt Gates and has no idea what he's talking about. He, he comes up with ideas during briefings, probably with some of his staffers as to what they can pull out of context and make a giant mess of and get attention for and then fundraise. That's my analysis. I think that's pretty accurate. I'm going to go ahead and say, well, Matt Gates, of course, is a terrible coward, a coward's coward. But, you know, who isn't this guy, the Ukrainian ambassador to the UN. His name is Sergei Kislitsya, and he said right to the Russian ambassador to the UN at the UN, right to his face, he said this. How have Russians got to the cruelty of Nazis? When have you started enjoying acting like Nazis? Killing civilians attempting to redraw internationally recognized borders, setting the task to finalize, finally resolve the Ukrainian issue, like Hitler attempted to resolve the Jewish issue. And apparently during a Security Council meeting at the UN that took place as the Russian invasion was beginning on February 24th, the, the Ukrainian ambassador said to the Russian ambassador, quote, go straight to hell while maintaining there was, quote, no purgatory for war criminals. So, yeah, that guy is brave. All right. Let's go from heroics now to idiocracy, where you another issue that got a lot of attention yesterday is when Marjorie Taylor Greene, congresswoman from Georgia, tweeted that any senator who confirms Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson is, quote, pro pedophile just like she is. Well, our friend Ellie Mistal unleashed on her last night on Joy Reid's MSNBC show. 
and I'm going to give you the whole two and a half minutes. Conservative political operatives have figured out what riles up their base. The fake threat that progressives are trying to indoctrinate their children, to groom them to become gay or trans. These terms, indoctrination, grooming, predator, accusing innocent people of being pedophiles or being soft on pedophiles, it is all so a very specific trigger for a group that is sinking its teeth into our political discourse. Folks like Marjorie Taylor Greene know that. There's a reason her pro-pedophile tweet is the attack du jour. It's a bat signal to QAnon. Joining me now is Ellie Mastal, Justice Correspondent for The Nation. And Ellie, you have made this point before, that when these people are saying over and over and over again, pedophile, 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 and then associating that with any Democrat in front of them, they are, it is a dog whistle to get the QAnon people and sick them on whoever that is. And you've talked about the fact that they know these people are dangerous and they're doing it on purpose because they don't care if... If this judge, if Judge Jackson gets hurt, I'm going to let you talk. Yeah, so when I first brought this up, what did these conservatives say? How dare you say that asking questions about her record is inciting violence against her? But you see, they ain't questions anymore. Because unfrozen caveman congresswoman is no longer asking questions. She's making declarative statements about pedophilia and who is for it and who is against it. And that's basically what you saw all throughout the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday, starting with hypocrite Lindsey Graham and going on down through their whole party. Now, these attacks are designed to attack uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson's not her record, but her personal character. And that we know that these uh, attacks um, can put her life and the life of her family and children in danger. And we know they know that. And we know that they have something particularly that they're angry at her about and it's not her it's not the alleged uh, uh, pedophile sentencing record it's the fact that yeah. Kentaji Brown Jackson sentenced Edgar Welch who is the guy who went to Comet Pizza in Washington DC looking for the pedophile ring to do violence he's the Pizzagate guy Kentaji Brown uh, Jackson sentenced him you know they didn't talk about that sentencing Oh, no, they want mm-hmm. to talk about all the other stuff. They didn't want to talk about the time where Katanji Brown sentenced that guy to four yep. years in prison. So the QAnon people are angry at her already. And now yeah. they come hey. over the top with these pedophilia attacks. It's designed to put her life in danger. And that's you're, you're so right that this is why we have to talk about it, because this is what they're doing on purpose. All right. Well, the ladies at The View didn't want to get left out on commenting on Marjorie Taylor Greene. Here is Joy Behar. Consequences for such a... You know, can I, can I apologize to Sarah Palin? Because this woman makes Sarah Palin look like Madame Curie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and also not a word about her pal Matt Gates, who's under investigation for a year for dating an underage girl. Yeah. Nothing on Roy Moore, but on these three, Romney Hello. All right. And if you didn't believe Ali Mistal, by the way, about them wanting basically to put her in danger. I mean, did you hear Tom Cotton yesterday on the Senate floor basically saying, you know, you got some Republicans saying they're pro pedophile or basically insinuating they are pedophiles or groomers of pedophiles, etc. And now here is Tom Cotton basically saying she would have, you know, given the chance she would have been someone who defended Nazis. Senator Tom Cotton referring to former Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, who was the lead prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials. You know, the last Judge Jackson left the Supreme Court to go to Nuremberg and prosecute the case against the Nazis. This Judge Jackson might have gone there to defend them. Well, there you go. Tom Cotton basically saying that Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson would have gone to Nuremberg to defend the Nazis. Okay. Because she defended those, uh, some of the detainees at Guantanamo Bay had never been charged with anything. All right, got it. Well, Republican Senate candidate J.D. Vance tried to outdo him and get a million views on this clip. He dropped, he's running for Senate in Ohio, and he hit, this is a weird political ad, and he basically asked voters to ignore attacks from people who are decrying them as racists. But the way he started this ad made it, Think like he might have been appealing to racists, almost like he was selling, hey, are you a racist? Do you hate Mexicans? Well, you're going to love me. Except this is what it sounds like from J.D. Vance in his new ad. Are you a racist? Do you hate Mexicans? The media calls us racist for wanting to build Trump's wall. They censor us, but it doesn't change the truth. 
Joe Biden's open border is killing Ohioans, with more illegal drugs and more Democrat voters pouring into this country. This issue is personal. I nearly lost my mother to the poison coming across our border. No child should grow up an orphan. I'm J.D. Vance, and I approve this message because whatever they call us, we will put America first. All right, I don't really know what to say about that other than it seems like J.D. Vance is asking for racists to vote for him because he's supporting replacement theory and blaming immigrants for his mother's addiction. Got it. All right, well, good luck with that. I don't even think... He's leading in the GOP primary there in in Ohio, but it's a choice between him and this other scoundrel, Josh Mandel. So keep it classy, Buckeyes. All right. Well, that's all the audio I've got for you. And I've got a lot more headlines, but I should mention the great Pete Coe, whose birthday it is today. Happy birthday, Pete Coe, at Pete Coe VO. If you want to wish him a happy birthday on Twitter each and every, almost every day, he makes He records an intro and a news dump jingle for this podcast, and I couldn't be more grateful to him. We all love you, Pete Coe. Let's see what you've got for us today. Oh, right. This one is a news dump jingle inspired by a story about uh, some birds who are very clever. Clever corvids with cravings for cockles is the headline at The Guardian in their country diary. The crows had shellfish grasped in their bills, which they dropped onto the rocky beach below. It's a great story, and here's the jingle it inspired by the birthday boy, Pete Coe. Clever crows and Warblington feeling kind of chuffed. They found new ways to eat shellfish on today's news dump. Ah! Oh, you gotta love those smart, smart birds in Britain. Smart British birds. Isn't that where they're from? Well, let's see what else we've got for you in today's news dump. Rapid fire headlines. The let's go from worst to best. I kind of organized them that way today. First, the worst coming from Oklahoma and Ohio, starting in Oklahoma, where lawmakers approved a bill to make performing an abortion illegal. That's right. Predictions are in June. Many states will make it illegal to get an abortion and punishable up to 10 years in prison. The Oklahoma House on Tuesday voted overwhelmingly for this bill. It would make performing an abortion a felony. Anyone convicted would face up to 10 years in prison and a $100,000 fine. I don't even know how to wrap my head around this news. On Twitter, Molly Jung Fast writes, Oklahoma is going to end legal abortion in August. Roe is over. That victory is a gone erased. <sighs> All right, well, I've got to move on to the next news story because it is the news dump, and this one is no fun either. But I promise you they get a little bit better as we go along. Ohio is now introduced the don't say gay version of, uh, of their bill and their state house. The bill would also prohibit the promotion of, quote, divisive concepts in the classroom and the workplace. Who gets to decide on what's divisive? I guess these right wing politicians to Ohio. House Republicans Monday introduced this bill, borrowing language from Florida's recently passed Don't Say Gay law, which prevents teachers from engaging in instruction related to sexual orientation or gender identity. It's not going to work. It's only creating massive confusion. It's going to backfire. That's my prediction. What do I know? Germany shut down the world's largest illegal marketplace on the dark net with help from the U.S., Hydra market sales were over 1 billion euros in 2020 alone, and German authorities took down this illegal marketplace on the dark net. It was a Russian language marketplace operating via a specific network called the Tor Network. Anyway, read all about that if you want. It's an interesting and important story. So is this one. Ivanka Trump met with the House committee probe in the January 6th attack. How come we didn't get to see that one? How come we didn't get to uh, hear her testimony? Her meeting comes after months of negotiations with the panel, and hopefully we will learn what came out of that. Well, here's big news coming out of Disney. More Disney news. Mickey Mouse is now able to hug again. Oh, for nearly two years I haven't been able to hug anybody, nor has anybody else. All the costume characters in Disney had to keep their distance from visitors because of the pandemic. They haven't been able to give uh, hugs, sign autographs, or interact up close with fans. That's about to change in a few weeks when the park's reintroducing the traditional 
character greetings. Oh, that's great. As is my Mickey Mouse impression. Don't mock it. JetBlue making a $3.6 billion for the discount airline Spirit Airlines. I'm not sure if they're going to get all the jets or just the ones with the propellers still on them. I kid Spirit Airlines. See what happens with that possible sale. The combination would, quote, position JetBlue as the most compelling national low fare challenger to the four large dominant U.S. carriers by accelerating JetBlue's growth. According to JetBlue, <laughs> I was reading their press release. All right, well, you may have heard about this uh, this fox that had been running around biting people in our nation's capital. Well, apparently animal control, they, they got it. They got the fox at 3.36 p.m., according to a tweet from the U.S. Capitol Police. It, it bit apparently like six people, like little nips, you know, but poor little fox is probably scared because he, he kept seeing Mac Gates and Madison Cawthorn tooling around them all. Well, how about this? Now they start to get better. President Biden's Coast Guard pick would become the first woman to command a military branch. How about that? Her name is Admiral Linda Fagan, and she is going to be the next commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, according to the administration. They nominated her if confirmed the first woman to ever lead a branch of the U.S. military. Another first for women in this administration, as he promised there would be many. Seems to be fulfilling that, and, and uh, cer- uh, certainly in terms of appointments that he's making. I thought this was really interesting news. A Native American tribe in Virginia, the Rappahannock, has re- reacquired 465 acres of sacred land at Phones Cliff in Virginia. Secretary of the Interior, a Native woman herself, Deb Holland, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Director Martha Williams celebrated the tribe's reacquisition of the land Friday, according to a press release from the Department of the Interior. Very interesting, very important. And so is this. Apparently, Burger King is being sued by customers who are claiming the Whopper the Whopper is smaller than advertised. Well, I know a few ladies who could have said the same about me, but nobody ever called me a Whopper, to be fair. The Whopper may well be only somewhat of a Whopper, at least in real life, right? CBS News. And a new class action lawsuit for Burger King customers are suing the chain over its marketing, claiming that the company makes the burger look about 35% bigger in its advertising than its its reality. What are they using? Baby hands in the commercials? What are they talking about? How is this an actual lawsuit? I don't know, but I love it. I'm loving it. Or is that McDonald's? All right, well, that's your news dump. That's all I've got for you. For all of yesterday's news, it is now time to get to my guests. Coming up for the first time, professor from American University. Very excited to bring you my conversation with Omakongo Dubinja, who I sat down with last week. And first, though, I spoke yesterday with Stephen Greenhouse, and he has covered the labor movement for over three decades. He's written several books, including most recently, Beaten Down, Worked Up, The Past, Present, and Future of American Labor. He's on Twitter at, at Greenhouse NYT, at Greenhouse NYT. Stephen and I talked about his latest writing at both Slate and The Atlantic. We talked a little bit about his book. He's also, by the way, the author of The Big Squeeze, Tough Times for the American Worker, which he released back in 2009. He was a reporter for the New York Times from 1983 to 2014, covering labor in the workplace for 19 years there. He also served as business and economics reporter and a diplomatic and foreign correspondent. I really enjoyed my conversation with him. I was psyched to get to sit down with him. He's accomplished so much of his, so much in his career, and he's clearly not done still writing about the labor movement. We talked about the Amazon, the achievement for those Amazon workers in Staten Island, as well as the labor movement as it stands today. You did hear, he was in his New York City apartment, you did hear a lot of horns beeping. It goes on and off, but I, I think it's all right. It makes you feel like you're in New York a, a little bit. All right, let's go right now. Talking about the labor movement with Stephen Greenhouse. All right, there he is, Stephen Greenhouse. I'm very excited to, to have you here to talk about an issue that I care so deeply about, and it is so important and relevant, and that is the labor movement. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here, Pete. 
So you've just written articles at Slate, and you've written an article at, at, at The Atlantic, and of course, longtime uh, writer at and contributor to The New York Times. Your books, there's very few people who have covered and understand the, the labor movement, certainly during our lifetime, as well as you documented in your book even before. But where were we in just a few years ago when you published your, your most recent book, and, and how far have we come? How would you frame that? Great question. So a few years ago, things were looking far less good for labor. Right. You know, the union movement was kind of down on its heels. There wasn't a whole lot of organizing. The organizing that there was was not that exciting. There wasn't much coverage, not that much going on. And then Donald Trump is president. And, you know, a lot of workers like Donald Trump. I wrote many articles saying that Donald Trump is really anti-union and doing very little for workers. And, you know, so when my book came out, things weren't looking good. The one real bright spot with a wave of teacher strikes in 2018 in West Virginia, Arizona, Oklahoma, you know, that really just a lot of people saw that unions could wake up again. And the teacher strikes really brought, you know, teachers together with other folks, parents of the unions, kids. And so now, you know, especially in the last six months a year, Pete, we've really seen this reawakening, some say a real resurgence of, of labor. Most recently, we've seen these very important union victories, unusual union victories at such anti-union companies as Amazon, where the win last Friday was humongous. You know, this victory against the nation's probably most fiercely anti-union company, you know, at a, at, a, at a place with 8,000 workers. That's really, really hard to pull off. Plus, the union victories at, at Starbucks, there have been union votes at 11 Starbucks thus far, and union has won ton, 10 out of the 11. That makes Starbucks look bad and must make Starbucks anti-union lawyers look really embarrassed. So we've seen these victories and also victories at you know REI in Manhattan and the Art Institute of Chicago and all these nonprofit groups. And then your listeners probably remember there were these big, highly publicized strikes last year at Kellogg's, at John Deere, at Nabisco. And so labor has really been waking up. You know, the sleeping giant has really been waking up. And, you know, one of the most remarkable things is among young Americans, just a lot of them are excited about unions. We're seeing graduate students and young adjunct professors and, and a lot of digital journalists and, and a lot of the people at Starbucks, of course, you know, 20, 20 somethings. And a recent Gallup poll found that 77 percent of young Americans approve of unions. So there's something in the blood, in the air, you know, with younger Americans that they I guess maybe they feel there's too much income inequality or there's too much wage stagnation or, or you know, Jesus, we finished college. We owe seventy thousand dollars in debt. And that sucks. And we're supposedly the first generation in American history that's going to end up worse off than our parents. And they say, but well, what are we going to do about it? Well, here's one one tool, one strategy labor unions. What about just the difference between the rate of union membership or between in general, the, the private sector versus the public sector? You're mostly focused on the, the private sector in these articles. And we're talking mostly about the movement. Of course, you said the impetus was the win for the for the teachers, I think, first in West Virginia and then that spread. But you've got teachers unions, you've got police, you know, municipal city workers. So private versus public. I mean, my understanding, at least a few years ago, I used to cite a statistic around 30 percent uh, of of the private of the public sector was unionized, but only like seven percent of the private sector. How how do the the two different sectors work together, and what's the difference in terms of are, are they all on the upswing? So that's a good question, Pete. So you're right about you know, one in three, about thirty three percent of government workers, public sector workers, are in unions, but only six point one percent, one in sixteen, private sector workers are in unions. And there are several big reasons for that. Generally, government employees, government employers don't fight hard against unionization. And, and some states don't allow public employees to unionize. You know, some of the southern states, the red states, but right. in the blue northwest, northeast, uh, midwest states, a lot of state governments allow police officers, firefighters, social workers, sanitation workers to unionize. And they don't fight the unionization efforts, whereas and I say this in detail in my book, Beaten Down, Worked Up, private sector companies in the U.S. fight harder against unionization than do companies in any other industrialized country in the world. So there's this like anti-worker, anti-union exceptionalism in the United States where companies fight tooth and nail against unionization, as we saw at Amazon, as we saw at Starbucks. So 
that's, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, when one in three American workers were in unions, companies didn't fight that hard against unionization. And they kind of accepted unions are legitimate institutions. They're facts of life. There are partners who will work with them to create more prosperity, uh, more profits, more productivity. I think, I don't know, you know, I think with the rise of Wall Street and, and putting more pressure on companies to maximize profits, companies took a much harder line towards unions, towards how they pay their workers. Of course, there's been more global competition in the past 20, 30 years. That's another reason companies have taken a hard line. But And I think business schools must be teaching all these MBAs that unions suck. You know, we believe in free enterprise. We, you know, we don't want unions gumming up the work. It's interesting you say that. That's an interesting. You say you think that MBA programs must be teaching that. Is there any evidence of that? I know that. No, they're certainly teaching that. But I think, you know, 50, 70 years ago, managers weren't learning all this union stuff the way they learn them today. And I think, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, I think it's part of the, the, you know, when CEOs are in their squash clubs or, or their their yacht clubs together. You know, they all think that, you know, if your workplace unionizes, you're a loser. You know, that's not supposed to happen. You know, we're <laughs> we're big, tough folks. And like we can't let these uh, these lefty unions. And there's like almost an allergy. So I, I used to be the New York Times economic correspondent yeah. in Paris for five years. And I wrote about companies in Britain and France and Germany and Denmark and Spain and Italy and Poland. And, you know, you know, corporate executives there, they don't see unions as the enemy. They see unions as like social partners they got to work with to create more prosperity. In the United States, I think a lot of companies, a lot of executives feel unions are the enemy, that they're a nuisance and that we got to stomp on them and snuff them out. And the, the attitude is really different. And I, so people ask, why is income inequality so much worse in the United States than in most European countries? I think partly it's because unions are so much weaker here. And also, you know, this that quarterly capitalism profit model to just squeeze the dime out of every every quarter, regardless of if it's even good for the future, the long, the short term future of the company. I, I feel like that's not as common in Europe, though. I did pull that right out of my ass, Stephen. I mean, I I totally you know, I used to be a regular business reporter before the labor report. I used to write many stories about how uh, what adjectives should we use, how dumb and how American companies were shooting themselves in the foot by focusing so much on short-term profits. And, and one of the ways you increase your good short-term profits is screw your workers, you squeeze your workers, yeah. you hold down pay, you reduce benefits, you know all this. Piece. In, in Germany, they have a, uh, is, isn't it the law? You have to have a member of, of the labor on the board? There's a whole system in Germany. You know, there are two boards of directors. There's a regular operating board of directors. And above that, there's called, so-called the supervisory board, which sets the general policy for the company and has a lot of power. And under German law, in large companies, unions elect 50 percent of the board members minus one. So there might be, you know, 10 corporate board members and nine uh, union members. So unions have a lot of say. People often ask, why is there so much less outsourcing in Germany than, than in the United States? Why do German companies invest so much more in training their workers than to American because companies. there's some guy big... on the board that says, if we do this, I won't have a job anymore, as opposed to the rest of the board that say, if we do this, we'll all have more houses. I yes, mean, yes, a yes, bit yes. hyperbolic. You mentioned in your in your slate piece, but well, you just mentioned how vociferous the private sector is in terms of fighting any any hint of organizing a union. And you mentioned in your slate piece, these people that were apparently making Thirty two hundred dollars a day to fight against this Amazon organization organizing for a union in, in Staten Island. Stephen, I mean, that's evidence of it. How, how do I, by the way, sell out everything I believe about organized labor and all my moral values? Because that is some good coin per day. Thirty two hundred dollars a day. Th- that That is the kind of I saw that detail and it kind of illustrates so much of what you've written about is this is what they're willing to spend. Meanwhile, uh, the people organizing barely have a pot to piss in. So I, I had this wise ass tweet the other day saying when companies have, you know, these anti-unit consultants paid thirty two hundred dollars a day, does that automatically backfire against them when Amazon workers who maybe if they're lucky, make thirty two hundred dollars a month are dealing with these consultants who make thirty two hundred dollars a day? They say, you know, screw this. I mean, you know, the millions of dollars that Amazon's spending on anti-union consultants, you know, Amazon says they can't give as much a raise. You know, let's why don't they pump that some of that money in, into raises into better benefits? 
So these anti-union consultants, I mean, it's a wonderful, lucrative deal. I mean, you know, yes, some people say they're, they're selling they're selling their souls. You know, I, I in my book, Beating Down Work Up, I, I, I quote uh, some guy who wrote a book, Confessions of a Union Buster. And like his first line is like, to be a union buster, you have to be ready to, to lie, to prevaricate, to manipulate all the time. It's so important that you've done that research in journalism and written about it and talked to those people. I mean, union buster. Imagine that as your job, but making that kind of money. Well, so, you know, you and others have, have been talking about how big of a deal what happened in Staten Island and Amazon is. Put it into perspective more specifically in terms of what you think this means. You've also written about some of the the setbacks that, that organizers have had uh, at places like Starbucks. While it works at, at one Starbucks, it's not going to work at another. We ta- you talk about the Amazon warehouse in Staten Island might not be the Amazon warehouse somewhere else. And one of the certainly the details I want to ask you about, maybe you can include this in this response, is is, is why it seems that so many of these people are disproportionately uh, black and brown minorities, immigrants as well, and, wh- and why that matters. I know I asked a lot there, so whatever you want to take sure. it. So the first Starbucks, the first of 9,000 corporate-owned Starbucks in the United States unionized in Buffalo in December. And that was a big deal and got a lot of attention. But, you know, it's a lot easier to unionize a Starbucks with, you know, 25 workers where you need 13 of the 25 to vote for a union than at a warehouse, an Amazon warehouse with 8,000 workers where you have to persuade thousands and thousands of people. So, the, you know, there were a lot of st- there's a lot written, a lot of coverage, you know, when the first Starbucks unionized because Starbucks is such a well-known company and was extremely anti-union. So it was a real achievement. Now, you know, the you know, I, I wrote the other day that the union victory at Amazon in Staten Island is, you know, I've covered labor, written about labor for 27 years now. It's definitely the biggest you know, against the odds, David v. Goliath victory in in decades. And and it has huge symbolic importance. You know, people, you know, Amazon is often seen as like the most ferociously anti-union company. And that, you know, cracking that nut is very, very hard because, you know, it's so anti-union to fight so hard. There's thousands of workers and the average Amazon worker is gone within eight months. So like, how do you reach all these workers when there's such turnover? Mm. And for this, you know, little independent union that was founded in Staten Island to win against Goliath, against this eight trillion pound gorilla, it was really something. And I think, you know, know, when I speak to experts on labor, they often say a big mantra of management and like why you shouldn't even try to unionize us. It's just totally futile. You're never going to win. You can't beat Walmart. You can't beat Target. You can't beat, you can't beat Amazon. Certainly you can't beat Amazon. Like, they done it. They did it. And I think this is going to encourage people at many, many other Amazon warehouses and non-Amazon companies to like, hey, if you could win at Amazon, uh, you could you could win anywhere. You know, if you make it in New York, New York, you can make it. You know, if you, and, and I just saw uh, something that Christian Smalls, a fired Amazon worker who is the person who really got founded this union and got the ball rolling to unionize in Staten Island. He's been he said he's been contacted by workers at more than 50 Amazon warehouses who are also interested in unionizing. Whether they can, you know, replicate his template, whether they can do the same thing, that's another question. I mean, clearly Christian Smalls and his, you know, best friend and organizing partner, Derek Palmer, they're brilliant, charismatic, likable guys. They know they know how to reach out to people. And, and you know, question is, if, if Amazon warehouses and other pro-union cities, whether Boston, Minneapolis, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, L.A., try to unionize, you know, will they succeed? Will they have the organizing genius, organizing energy of Christian Smalls and Derek Palmer? Uh, the jury is out on that, but I imagine some will. How much does the ethnicity matter? How much do communities of color matter? Because, you know, a lot of things are just cultural. They're, they're ethnic. You, you know, people in your, in your community, at your church, in your neighborhood. And, and that's how you get support. And that's how you get organized. You see these warehouse workers today. So, so, I mean, I was going to say disproportionately black and brown might not be true in, in areas where they're predominantly white. You know, these warehouses are, are everywhere, but certainly you think about these union jobs that, my my parents' generation had they were high paying jobs whether it be UAW on the assembly line or digging coal out of the ground you could you could support a family so much has changed in including demographics with the country and with with labor certainly in in many industry why does that matter 
No, no, that's a that's a good question, Pete. So I've read that a majority of the workers at the Staten Island Amazon warehouse are African American or Hispanic, and many of them are immigrants. And you know, many African Americans are generally more you know African Americans are generally the most pro union part of the population because so many blacks have seen how unions have lifted their their people and their family. You know, you look at you know so many subway workers, so many bus drivers, so many. You know, city employees here in New York, they're in unions and they've done very well. And and uh, so I think there's this pro-union proclivity, you know, uh, leaning among many, you know, black and Hispanic, you know, many Hispanic workers are from, El, you know, El Salvador, Nicaragua, uh, you know, Colombia, where there are very active unions and a lot of them also feel, feel pro-union. So, you know, one of the interesting things in Amazon is that, so there's this warehouse with 8,000 workers these two leaders, Christian and Derek, and they had this team of like 24 main worker organizers, people who work there. And, you know, there was an African immigrant, there were several Hispanics, and they all reached out. The African immigrant, you know, Brim Brim Michelle set up a a WhatsApp chat for African workers or immigrant workers to like answer questions and make people, you know, explain to people the advantages of this union. Ditto with the Latino and Latina workers there. Sorry about all the the horns honking outside my window. And so, yes, it's like church, you know, people often reach out to folks in their own community. And and I think that was one of the secrets of the success uh, in Staten Island. Having said that, Pete, so the um, Amazon warehouse in Bessemer, Alabama, where the where workers voted overwhelmingly against the union last year by more than a two to one margin. And they and they recently held a revote where the union is only slightly behind Hmm. With uh, several with several challenge votes still to be counted, that warehouse is overwhelmingly African American, but it it voted against the union. I think being in New York, a pro union state, you know where you know where many people have relatives who've been in unions, I think really helped you know help tilt things in favor of the union. Oh, that's also, very and, and Alabama's Alabama's you know a, a very red right to work state, and also. And, and people make fun of me when I say it's like at, in Staten Island, most of the workers took public transportation to work. So the union, the union organizers were able to talk to them nonstop at, at the bus stops, whereas in, at Amazon in, in Alabama, all the workers drive to work and you, it's very hard to talk to them because you're not allowed on company property and they'll zoom by you on the way to work and the way home. And so that was very, very. So that made it much harder. And in New York, you know, a lot of politicians supported the unionization drive in Staten Island. In Alabama, almost all the politicians, you know, gave a thumbs down to the unionization drive. They're Republicans, and uh, many of them would like unions to go to hell. Well, you you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned that, and and you write about it in your book, and you know, you point to the issue. Obviously, really not is not going to change much if you don't change the laws around campaign finance. So Republicans have one ideology, which is anti-union, and Democrats often, increasingly, obviously, uh, support them. And until that paradigm changes with the money that comes in from these big companies, much less entire industries colluding to hire the same lobbyists, then then we're not going to see change. Although it does seem we have seen some change despite the campaign uh, finance and the money that continues to flow specifically and especially to Republicans to make sure that they vote uh, every possible way they can against allowing unions to operate in, in their states. Do you still think that that's the case, that that's the biggest issue or uh, when it comes to politics, campaign finance? Uh, so there are so many issues in politics, Pete. It's like hard to know where to start. I mean, yeah. you know, stepping back, I think one of the big problems in America, and, you know, we talk about this all the day, is like our democracy is declining. You know, we're becoming a minority, a minority of voters. You know, the senators in Wyoming, there are two senators from Wyoming with what, less than a million people and yeah. two senators from California with more than 30. But so it's you know it's our government our structure is very undemocratic and beyond that is there the super duper messed up campaign finance system where gazillionaires like the Koch brothers Sheldon Adelson you know can give a hundred million dollars in a campaign and their voice will dwarf that of the typical Walmart worker or teacher or police officer or firefighter and it's just the system so broke that the very rich can have such a disproportionate voice. So, you know, I think that's a big reason. So, so take a very fundamental issue like better child care. The United States, you know, has one of the worst child care systems among any industrial mm-hmm. nation in, in, in the world. And yet Joe Manchin, you know, votes against, you know, spending more money on child care. I think 
he must be getting money from some conservative gazillionaires who say, we're against big government. We don't want government doing this and doing that. And like, you know, so what if, you know, all these people can't afford child care? And, you know, so I think corporate money, billionaire money has way too much influence. And unions, union leaders often talk about how the playing field is tilted against unions when they seek to unionize. That, you know, and this is very true at the uh, Amazon uh, warehouse in, in Alabama, the company prohibits union organizers from setting foot on company property. You can't even go into the parking lot to put a flyer on a car's windshield while the, the company has 100 percent access, 20, you know, access 24 seven to propagandize workers with meetings and, and banners and videos and break rooms and lunch rooms. So unions and increasingly Democrats say, you know, our labor laws are broken. They tilt in favor of companies uh, and they tilt against unions. Let's try to amend them to make it easier to unionize, make them fairer for unions. Yet every time there's been an effort since the National, Asia, National Labor Relations Act was enacted in 1935, every time there's been an effort to pass a federal law to make it easy, easier to unionize, Republicans filibuster and stop it. That happened under Linda Baines Johnson, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, uh, Barack Obama, and now the same thing has happened with, with Joe Biden. So Republicans are eager to weaken unions, you know, I think for several reasons. They're billionaire donors, the corporate donors, you know, are against unions. They don't want unions to be stronger because, hey, if unions are stronger, we might have to give several, you know, some of our billions of dollars in profits, fork over some more of our billions of dollars in profits into better pay and benefits. And if unions are stronger, they might help elect Democrats. So I think a lot of Republicans would like to see, would like to do what Scott Walker of Wisconsin did to did to unions, like really eviscerate them, really cripple them so they're much weaker in politics. So well said about the politics of it all. It's very, very important, obviously, component of it. Just want to ask you one more, I think, thing here. I mean, I could talk to you forever. This is, this is an issue I care so deeply about, and I think it matters so much, even if you're not in a union, you're all we're all benefiting overwhelmingly from organized labor. Well, two more quick question is, I remember being on set at CNN and asking a political analyst who I, I really respected why this is during the 2012 election, Romney and Obama, why on earth would union workers vote for Mitt Romney or any Republican who wants to destroy all of the benefits of their union, which they're not, you know, you're not forced to be in union. You go to work in this job in this industry, you're usually lucky to, to, to get that at job. And that political analyst said to me, because he's black. And that was the end of that conversation. I, is it that simple? So, Pete, I imagine you and many of your listeners, you know, remember the book, What's the Matter with Kansas? Yep. That says, you know, many Americans, whether union members or farmers or, or, or non-union members, excuse me, they vote against their economic interests. You know, the Democrats, and there are a lot of, you know, flaws with the Democrats, but that generally they try to do more to provide better benefits to workers, better protections for workers, raise the minimum wage. They're pushing for, you know, we are the only industrialized nation in the world that doesn't have a law guaranteeing all workers paid parental leave. You know, we're the only industrial nation in the world that doesn't have a law guaranteeing all workers paid vacation. And Republicans are against all those things. They vote against increasing the minimum wage. So Republicans know, and then, you know, there's always great stuff about you know Richard Nixon strategizing once upon. They know we lose on economic issues vis-a-vis -vis the Democrats. So we have to find cultural issues to woo the working class to vote Republican. And Nixon made a big issue out of crime. More recently, Republicans say, you know, we're the party that's against abortion. We're the party that's against, you know, giving rights to transgender. Right. We're the party right. against uh, gay marriage. So like, you know, working class people, if you want to be good and good Christians and good traditionalists, you know, vote for us, the Republicans. And, and you know, and all these workers were fooled into voting for Donald Trump. Right. And Donald Trump, he did virtually nothing for workers. He didn't raise the minimum wage. He didn't you know, provide better, you know, better, you know, again, you know, there's been all this push for paid parental leave. He did nothing on that. His tax breaks humongously favor the rich over typical American workers. And and uh, it was the one thing was, his, his daughter advocated the most for, I believe, Ivanka, something on 
I think, paid you know maternity uh, leave, something like that. And of course, didn't didn't happen because of what you're saying. And by the way, you mentioned Thomas Frank's uh, book, but I, I think Jonathan Metzl's book, Dying of Whiteness, is an almost more updated version. How the politics of racial resentment is killing America's heartland. A really great look at what you're talking about. And there's been an academic study, a recent academic study by Paul Farmer at Princeton saying one of the good things about unions is they reduce racial resentment among workers, especially among white workers. You have unions are these great things where blacks, whites, Hispanics, Asians all come together and work together to improve things for everybody. And, and they're, they're, they're exposed to people of other races and other nationalities, speaking other languages. And they realize, you know, these aren't bad people. They want the same thing we want. And so that's one of the reasons a higher percentage of union members vote for Democrats and reject the, you know, the kind of semi-racist Republican demagogues who, you know, who really milk the idea of racial resentment and say, oh, blacks are, are, are catching up on you or to right. you and immigrants right. are taking jobs away from you. And unions can really help overcome that resentment. Lastly, you have a note in your or in your in your piece in The Atlantic published uh, today when we're talking here you basically are are giving some criticism or even advice to the labor movement, specifically to the nation's unions. You write, the nation's unions need to help train workers across the U.S. on how to use this organizing model. They also need to invest some serious money to underwrite worker to worker union drives. Uh, they seem to be operating on, on, on some in some old some old ways and not necessarily, it sounds like, leveraging what these successes that we're seeing are leveraging and, and, and how they're taking advantage of it. What, what are you saying that the, the nation's current kind of uh, legacy unions that are doing good work need to do? So th- this kind of goes back to your very first question, Pete. You know, how, does, how are things now compared with uh, five and 10 years ago? This is an extremely promising moment for labor. I mean, in ways, it's the most promising moment for labor that we've seen in decades yes. because, you know, young workers are really excited about unions. They're really jazzed. A lot of them are really upset and frustrated and exasperated. Plus, you've had these, you know, very highly publicized union victories, one at Amazon, one at Starbucks. Like, you know, I've written about labor for almost three decades, and I've heard, you know, untold numbers of union leaders say, oh, we're doing our best to reverse the decline of labor unions. And remember, you know, back in the 1950s, one in three people were in unions. Now it's just one in 10. And I don't think... Labor leaders, I'm not saying all, but, you know, labor leaders generally aren't doing nearly enough to seize on this moment and and maximize the opportunity here. So we have, you know, this new organizing model, this new unionization model at Amazon and at Starbucks, where it's not really paid union organizers doing it. It's really worker to worker organizing. It's bottom up. It's so-called self-organizing. And it's a great, successful model. It really excites the workers. They, you know, gives, they feel agency. They feel they're really doing it themselves. But they don't have a lot of money. The, the Staten Island effort, they raised money through GoFundMe. It cost only $100,000, which is like walking around money for many big labor unions. So I write in my Atlantic piece, Pete, that this is a rare opportunity for unions to really help the overall workers' movement, union movement grow. But the Christian Smalls and the Derek Palmers who – spearheaded the, the the effort in Staten Island, if they had to bring their magic to Seattle or Minneapolis or Chicago or Cleveland or Buffalo or or San Francisco or, or San Jose, you know, they need some money. And the big unions have the money, they have the lawyers, and, and they could really help make this multiply, perhaps exponentially. And if the goal is, you know, increasing worker power and building a fair economy, then you have to seize the moment. You have to seize the opportunity. And I argue that the nation's unions aren't doing nearly enough of that. Great piece in The Atlantic. Of course, also at Slate, you wrote about Amazon and, uh, of course, uh, your books, uh, which are all linked to in the show notes and, and everything else on Twitter. You've been doing amazing work, award winning work for, for decades now. It's so Thank great you. to catch up with you again, Stephen. I really appreciate you, you joining me here on the show. Great to be here, Pete. Keep up the good work. Yeah, how about it? Stephen Greenhouse. And how about this music from listener Patrick Wilson, who is really excited to hear me playing it yesterday. Thanks, Patrick. Anybody that wants to write and submit music for these kind of transition periods from one guest to the the next or whatever else, whatever else you want to contribute to sound, to this show, to this ideas, to the program, I like to think of it as our show. So guest ideas, jokes, 
segments, ways to take it, how to promote it, you name it. I love it. I like to think of it as some kind of a collective somehow. So thank you to Stephen Greenhouse. That was awesome. Check him out on Twitter. Go get those books and follow him on Twitter for sure. Greenhouse NYT. That was his first time on the podcast. So please say hello to him. And it's also my next first time, my next guest first time on as well. And I was really happy to get him on. He's a professor at American University. He is a well-known and sought after speaker. He's a poet, a rapper, an actor, as well, he's a regular contributor on a whole bunch of other media shows, and I was really happy to have him on to talk about a wide range of issues from diversity and equity and inclusion that I'm advocating for in my community to so much more. We did get into the slap. I should say this interview taped the day after the Oscar, so we were still kind of reeling from that, and I had some audio issues that I hopefully was able to fix and, and get it on here. But very excited to have Dr. Omakongo Dabinja on the show for the first time i think you're really going to like this conversation so let us do it all right i've just told you all about and i'm very glad to welcome him to stand up for the very first time dr omikanga dobinga ah, i screwed it up <laughs> dr omikango dobinga and you welcome to the show thank you very much for joining me thank you for having me i'm excited to talk to you i'm a fan yeah, I, I, when I reached out to you today, I was like, oh, man, I'd love to get this guy on. I'm really interested in his work and his voice. Super talented, super smart guy. But, you know, hopefully I don't have to jump to, through too many hot hoops to get him, you know, to convince him to come join me. Then I see that you actually already were following me on Twitter. I guess you, you knew me from uh, the Karen Hunter show, which I was like, oh, perfect. So yeah, I'm, yeah. Psyched to, I'm psyched to have you on. No doubt. Thank you. Yeah, let's talk about just real quick you and, and your life. And I think the TED talk I watched of yours, you talked about your, your childhood growing up with what, seven siblings in Boston and speaking of your name, how just you and your siblings were all ridiculed. But you're born and raised in America, but your yeah. parents gave you this very ethnic, tough to pronounce name, which I guess didn't do you any favors as a kid. Tell me about your childhood. Man, no favors whatsoever. Yes, my parents are of Congolese origin and they felt that it was important for our, their children to have a connection to the to the continent. And so they named us the way they are. We are named in Congo. My full name can't fit on Twitter. So make Congo Luhaka Wadabenga Wangaka Kese Washington Casa. That, that's most of it. And, you know, growing up in Boston in the 70s and 80s, and I had siblings so older than me, you know, it was a time of the Sally Struthers commercials with the Ethiopians and the popping bellies. You got Tarzan all over the place. And so everywhere I went, people just likened us to animals. You know, questions, oh, did you arrive here on a boat? Where did you learn English? You got monkeys in your closet? All of that. So we were beat up, rocks thrown at us. It was terrible. We got it from students. We got it from teachers. And so growing up, you know, we would make nicknames so we could just like, because we don't have that quote unquote African accents. So if you didn't know, you didn't know. So we would just make up names, call me O and all of that type of stuff, just so we can kind of get along. But as, as we got a little bit older, we had to make sure that we let people know to respect our names. And then on top of that, I grew up at the height of the crack epidemic. So crime infested Boston. It was predicted as a black male that we would be dead or incarcerated before the age of 25. And then not growing up with a lot of money. But, you know, through all of that, they say that you don't define your circumstances. Well, you define your circumstances. Your circumstances don't define you. I was able to emerge from that and go on and travel the world, study at Princeton, Morehouse, Harvard, MIT, got my doctorate. I actually have a PhD in Jay-Z, just coming from teaching my Jay-Z class. Uh, so I, I enjoy that. And now I get to travel the world and inspire people with my poetry, my music and my and my speeches. Yeah, you're one of the most sought off speakers out there uh, uh, today. And on, sub on the subject matter, of course, that you speak on, I was watching your talks. They're really riveting, even on video. I'd love to be in the audience at some point. Thank uh, you. What do you mean you got your PhD in Jay-Z? So I wrote my doctorate at the, it's called The Life and Rhymes of Jay-Z, Historical Biography. It's, a, it's an examination of Black youth post-civil rights era through a hip-hop lens, using Jay-Z as the point of departure. Jay-Z born in December 4th, 1969, the same day that Black Panther leader Fred Hampton was assassinated. And so when you look at his life trajectory from then to now, it's a great exposition in terms of Black youth post-civil rights, and it's completely focus on the life of Jay-Z and the experiences that happened around the world as they would affect Jay-Z's life. And so at American University, where I teach, I teach a course on how to write historical biography, and I use Jay-Z as an example. Wow. Does, have you ever met him? 
I met him once. I met him backstage at, at a concert. I was working with Michael Eric Dyson as his teaching assistant. And he went up to a concert. We went backstage. And at that time, I was doing the dissertation. And I told him. And he looked at me like I was crazy. But uh, he thought he looked at it. Um, he was, seemed very interested in it as well. So got to make sure he gets that and reads that. Uh, you have worked with uh, a lot of uh, brilliant people. And now I'm sure a lot of young people are, are working with you. And you're the brilliant person. But you're, you're at American University now as well as speaking and writing. And uh, does that mean you work with Ibram Kendi? Well, I, he left uh, about a year and a half ago. So he was only here for about a year. So a year or two, maybe. And I met him once and I was really looking forward to building with him and doing some work. But now he's up in Boston at Boston University. I didn't even realize that. Um, yeah, he started the anti-racism research center here. And then uh, unfortunately, you know, ended up departing. So we miss him. Well, that's why I wanted to explore that first with you, because I interviewed him uh, a few years ago for the first time and, and, and several times since I've read his books, uh, really made a, a, a huge impact on my thinking, his writing. And now here I am in the fight at the Board of Education against uh, my neighbors who are these mm -hmm. anti CRT people. And they use his name in a pejorative way. Even they even called me Ibram Kendi Dominic. And I was like, wow, we're really through this looking glass, this guy who I have on a pedestal. They're actually using it against me as if it's an insult in which, of course, to me, it's like, this is a brilliant guy. We also yeah, saw, yeah, you know, yeah. obviously Ted, Ted Cruz and, and so many other folks on the right who have uh, been critical of, of his work and anti-racism in general. I hear the maybe unintended effect is that his, his, his books are selling better than ever as a result, yeah. which I think is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. But what are your thoughts on him and the idea of anti-racism anti -racism being demonized by so many people right now. Look, I teach a class on intercultural communication at, at American University, and we talk about Dr. Kendi's work every semester, because really at the end of the day, and he didn't make up the term anti-racism, but people are acting as if he did. Uh, this has been a tour, Angela Davis has used it in the past. And what Dr. Kendi is saying, for those who don't know, is that saying that you're not racist is not enough because right. everybody's quick to say, well, I'm not racist. Some of my best friends are white or some of my or some of my best friends are black or some of my best friends are Asian. Or some people say some of my they will say some of my best friends are black. They'll say some of my best friends have black friends. Oh, <laughs> you know, but he's saying you got to actively be fighting it. And to be either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. So rather than saying you're not racist, what did you do today when that racist comment was made on your Facebook post? What did you say today when you were at lunch and somebody made a racist comment? If you're not saying anything, you are part of the problem. You know, when we talk about people like Hitler, right? You know, people talk about Hitler like he was some Martian or something, right? Hitler didn't exist in a vacuum. Hitler was a human being who put himself through his obsession with power in a position where no one would challenge him and did the most heinous things. And I believe that rather than talking about Hitler like a Martian, talk about him as a human being who did despicable, terrible things that can happen again right. if right. we don't challenge it. How many genocides have we had since the Holocaust? And so what Ibram Kendi's doing, he's challenging us to be action oriented so we can stop the ignorance at its door before it gets to the next level. And one of the things that he says in his books that we really have to be mindful of, that racism is more about self-interest than anything else. And so when he gives the example of slavery, you know, people said that it was about teaching black people the one true God, but he was like, no, it was about economic interest, you know, at the end of the day. And I think that he really flipped the conversation in ways that people need to pay attention to. And so when it comes to CRT, one of the challenges we have to understand is that CRT is not taught in K-12 schools. I know CRT because I've read the work of Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw since they created this stuff in the 80s. But we have to understand that these are talking points that these guys want to use. Yeah. And rather than looking at it as critical, uh, critical race theory, we need to look at CRT as culturally responsive pedagogy, culturally responsive teaching. Because really, at the end of the day, I work in public, private, and charter schools on the K-12 level every single day. And CRT is not being taught in schools. It's another code word that they want to use to try to deny us from having our own history be taught in schools. And I'm glad that Dr. Kendi and so many others are calling it out. Yes, but they're not only calling uh, uh, being critical of CRT. The other argument now is that CRT, I'm sure you've heard this, it's mind-blowing, is code 
or that DEI is code for CRT. Yep. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. All the schools that you work at, I'm sure, have some kind of initiative for that. We can talk about what works best, what is well intended, but might not uh, get the greatest results. But mm-hmm. DEI, by the way, of course, not only about race. As a matter of fact, right. it can be about so many other things, including learning disabilities when it comes to in, in, including uh, those students in, in mainstream coursework. But what do you say to that? What do you say to people who say DEI is code for CRT? Because it leaves us with very few tools in our communities and in our schools and in our organizations and workplaces to be anti-racist if we can't talk about diversity and embrace diversity, inclusion and equity and try to become better. What, what, what do we do? Well, diversity, equity, and inclusion, that is my expertise. That is the work I do every single day. And like I said, I'm not only doing this work in in schools, I'm also doing this work in corporate spaces. I may leave here and go talk to Microsoft, Prudential, working in government spaces with the State Department, looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion from an international perspective. So yes, absolutely. These people who are trying to conflate these things have no idea what they're talking about. And one of the things that you said, which is extremely important, is that diversity is not just about race. In this country, we are programmed to think about diversity, only about race and then gender. But there are so many other issues. There's diversity of political ideology, diversity of religion, of physical ability, of economic status, of language, of of so. And how about one of these ones that we don't like to talk about so much because we're so caught up in, quote unquote, cancel culture, diversity of thought. Just thinking about things differently, that all goes into what makes diversity. And so people who are so caught up in some type of nostalgic idea of things that never fully existed want to recreate a society where they didn't have to talk about these issues. But when you look at what happened with with the Oscars and all the diversity of the people who won, deaf people, people who identify part of the queer community and so on and so forth, diversity, equity, inclusion is not going away. And it's also tied into this pushback with the don't say gay bill as well, because people don't want to share sexual, have sexual orientation stories shared. They want to do everything to keep everything white, heterosexual and and male and and middle to upper class on top of that, because they don't care about poor people either. And that is where part of the problem is. You know, Lyndon Johnson said, and this is to all the poor white people out there or who don't realize that you have more in common with many people in, in, in other communities as opposed to the rich white community. Lyndon Johnson said, I learned at a young age that if you can convince the poorest white man that he's better than the best colored man, he won't realize you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him someone to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. So many people out there fighting, quote unquote, CRT and diversity, equity and inclusion and fighting against policies about policing and anti-poverty measures and health care. They are fighting against their own self-interest to preserve this fake thing called whiteness. And we're all suffering because of it. So well said and such an important quote. Never gets old to bring that up. Um, going back to anti-racism, you, you mm-hmm. talked about what it means so eloquently. Uh, by the way, my go to is usually black roommate, two black roommates. <laughs> <laughs> yep, the yep. point is, the point is you could be married. You could yes. be a white person married to a black person with mixed race kids. Yep. If And you can love people individually. I'm not racist. I, I have a ton of black friends. I work with black people. I have no problems with, with black folks. I have a, have a racist bone in my body. But I do think that there's a huge difference. Not that, that words don't matter. Obviously, we're, we're, talk, we're going to talk about the, what happened at the Academy Awards. Mm-hmm. Words do matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, they certainly do matter. Unfortunately, a lot of people only believe that, that it, the only racist thing you can say or do is to call a person the N-word. Or run across or something. Right. Something very overtly that even now we wouldn't disagree upon. Although, you know, a lot of people who, you know, are white supremacists say they're not racist. We can get into that later. My, my point is, it doesn't matter your relationships, your personal relationships with black folks as much as it matters what policies you support. So to me, if you have all the black roommates and black friends and black coworkers in the world and not a racist bone in your body, but you vote for somebody who makes it harder for black people to vote. To me, policy is, is, is what is systemic. And so yep. it's not that rhetoric and behavior doesn't matter and doesn't marginalize folks. But to me, I always think I always want to ask people, OK, so you're not racist. You have a lot of black friends. Who, who do you vote for? That's what do you right. think of, of, of that point? It's true. And this goes back to, to Ibram Kendi's work and, and work that I'm writing about, you know, in, in my book that's coming out, 10 Lies About Black People. You know, one of the things that Dr. Kendi talks about is this idea of having a racist idea. You see, one of the challenges is that we 
when we have these conversations, one of the things I argue is that we need to define terminology before we even engage in the conversation. Because if you're working off one definition, Pete, and I'm working off another definition, we're never going to come to the same page. It's like athletes, right? When you say who's the greatest basketball player of all time, someone's automatically going to say Jordan or LeBron or Kobe. But then my question becomes, what's the criteria? How do you define it? Because if it's greatest scorer, it's Kareem. If it's most championships, it's Russell. The list goes on and on and on. But we don't define these topics. So there's a difference between being individually racist systemically racist, which is what you're talking about, and having a racist idea. So which ones are we talking about when we have the conversation? And so somebody might say, I got black friends, but like you said, you're voting for somebody like a Trump who has systemically racist policies. Therefore, you are part of the problem. You may have black friends, you may hate Trump, but you just kind of feel that white people are smarter. They're naturally gonna score higher on, on tests. You naturally just kind of feel that black people are better athletes. Those are racist ideas. And all three of those have importance. But like you said, we get stuck on somebody using the N-word or somebody burning a cross that we don't look at the deeper systemic issues. And we need clear definitions before we engage in conversation. But most people online, they're just trying to talk to their base. They're not talking to each other. That's why they don't care about the definitions. They're just trying to score points in viral moments. Oh, boy, I love listening to all of the things and words that you are saying and the way that you say them. But let's just though talk about words. I didn't I'm not dismissing words and rhetoric. Yeah. Um, and let's just talk as, as a way to get into it about what happened at the Academy Awards. You know, these are two black men um, and Will Smith, you know, and, and a black woman. And, and we should talk about her agency. You had a really interesting tweet about that. And a lot of people are talking about, uh, um, well, a lot of different ideas. But but just in terms of the words. I think I saw somebody defining violence as not only physical violence, but words do violence. I mean, we are yes, seeing yes. trans kids killing themselves and we could give many examples. So what about words that do actually create damage? I mean, look, if you go back to any Holocaust, genocide, slavery, Armenian genocide, Rwanda, Congo, the, you know, what's going on with the, with the Uyghur population, the Rohingya, like the list goes on and on. You first start to target people violently by using language to dehumanize them. And once you start talking about people as roaches, as vermin, all things that have happened through our history, it becomes justifiable to kill them. And it actually starts, Pete, with cartoons. Because if you, as you know this, if you look at cartoons from the 40s and so on and so forth, the way Bugs Bunny was used to talk about like Jewish people and all of that, so you get the kids laughing, then you get the siblings laughing, then you get the parents laughing, then you get the teachers laughing, then you get policy. And so yes, language is the first entry to violence because once you do that, that's when it becomes problematic. And so uh, are we talking about the o Oscars right now? My, yeah, my yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a yeah. lot with yeah, this. So let me, let, me, let me ask you one specific question. Yes. Well, a number of specific questions. But, but first of all, I, I had a weird, I'm, I'm struggling with how important this is and how to talk about it. And obviously everybody wants to hear uh, my, my point of view on this. <laughs> nobody wants, nobody cares. Everybody thinks <laughs> everybody wants to hear my point of view. Everybody wants my white point of view. Um, <laughs> no, this David Pakman is a, uh, a very popular liberal progressive commentator. One of the most popular online. I like him a lot. I rarely disagree with him, but he tweeted earlier. He tweeted, I'm having a, a really hard time caring about the Will Smith, Chris mm. Rock thing. Can someone give me a hot take that I can pass off as my own? Other people are reacting to, hey, there are more important things. Black woman on, on uh, CNN that does great work, Sarah Seidner, even mm -hmm. said, I feel almost guilty talking about this when there's a war in Ukraine, which I think she'd also been covering. But to me, I, I don't think to a certain segment of America, certainly it would seem black America cares a lot about this, at least black folks on Twitter and social mm -hmm. media. Um, in my in my life, care a lot about this. So what do you say to Pacman or anybody else who says there are way more important things than two rich celebrities who, yes, happen to be black men mm -hmm. um, and what happened at the Academy Awards? What do you say to that? I say at the base level, you should be concerned with violence being enacted against somebody else. You should be concerned with language that is broadcast around the world that could be con that is disrespectful towards a woman, and in this case, it's a black woman, a black woman who many people are comfortable using as, as, as punching bags, and pun is intended on this, you know, in, in every way, shape, or form. 
And in, in a society where violence is on the rise in terms of hate crimes, school shootings, the things that are happening in social media in terms of what is being posted, you're seeing fights breaking out in Atlanta and all this other type of place. He should be concerned that two of the country's leading celebrities are engaged in acts of violence for the entire world to see. That should be a problem for him. I don't know anything about his family or relatives, if he got kids, grandkids, but they are seeing these things and they need to be able to process it as well, as opposed to possibly viewing this as an acceptable way to respond when you have a problem. And that's why he should care about this and everyone else should as well. You know, I, I, I fully agree with you. Um, I want to read uh, two tweets, one uh, at least, and then, and then yours. Uh, but my friend Michael Cohen, not that Michael Cohen, the <laughs> former Boston Globe columnist, writes, I'm hard-pressed to think of anything more sexist and toxic than the idea Will Smith had to slap a man to, quote, protect his wife. You tweeted, there's a misogynistic issue missing in this hashtag Will Smith assault debate. Jada Pinkett Smith, Jada Pinkett Smith, most of our talk is about Will Smith and Chris Rock. Jada is only brought up as his wife, his woman, et cetera. I feel Jada is being lost in this. We must do better. And I know that we're two men talking about this. I'm going to talk with a lot of women about this and especially black women about, about this. But I think that the point that Michael's making, the point that you're making is a really important point. But go ahead and expand on that here uh, than you did on Twitter. Yeah, because in, in many ways, you know, J Jada has become the, the punchline in all of this. And, and I... I have so much love for any way that somebody has love for a celebrity, the highest level of affection. Will Smith is that guy for me. I've been riding with him since day one. We're going back to the 80s because in my career, when I talk about rappers putting out positive images, he is the guy that has done that in ways that no one else has done. So it hurt me to see that. And of course, I have respect for Chris Rock. And I've been rolling with Jada since day one in terms of knowing her in the public space, seeing her on television. So, you know, when I listen to Will's book, which is powerful and everybody should read it. You know, he talks about how his mother was abused by his father. And he talks about feeling like he couldn't protect her. He also talks about incidences where he got into a physical altercation with executives at NBC and how he also had a girlfriend who when she went out on, wanted to leave the house and he said she did, couldn't leave or shouldn't leave, she left and he took all of her stuff and burned all of her belongings. So there's a pattern there of some of the things that he talked about and the learning lessons he had to have. And so, Part of me had to ask the question of, you know, were you defending Jada or were you defending your wife, which is a little bit more of a possessive type of thing. And so when I see this situation, I teach classes on hip hop, my Jay-Z class, Global Hip Hop and Resistance. America is used to pitting black men against each other and black men against women. That's how rappers get famous through rap beef, Jay-Z, Tupac, uh, Nas, Biggie, Tupac, 50 Cent, Ja Rule. Like it's part of the industry. And so to see that happen in this entertainment space as well, it's depressing and it's frustrating and it hurts. And you see, you know, Jada caught in the middle. I don't know what her reaction is. I think that what Chris Rock said was wrong. There's no doubt about it. But to get to that point where it turns to physical violence for these guys who have been models for our community, we all need to step back. We need to check our misogyny at the door. We need to be able to look at how we analyze this and see if we can build from a community that, that is in, in a healing space. I've seen some people online even blaming, blaming Jada for, for creating this and talking about what she talks about in the red table or whatever that thing is called. And she put Will out there. What? And no, no, no. Condemn the violence. Don't talk about, we can talk about people defending their family, but does it have to start with violence? No, there are other ways to handle that. And we have to be better. We can't condone violence uh, against us, but not condone violence between us. Well said. I, I just think that there's let, let me uh, defend Chris Rock. He really he's at he reached out to me and he said, Pete, listen, I need your voice. <laughs> <laughs> he's like hey, listen of all the people <laughs> that are texting me sandler spade um chris rock has made many jokes about them before mm -hmm. uh that night one of the other comedians presenters regina hall made a joke about their their relationship that was open relationship mm -hmm. um those jokes i would say are a lot worse the open relationship things this is what the Oscars are for comedians. Mm -hmm. They are uh, everybody saying it's classless or tasteless. Yeah. Most of the time, yeah. Robin Williams was that way. Certainly rock has been that way. Obviously Ricky Gervais has mm -hmm. been that way. Mm -hmm. And Amy Schumer was that way to some extent yeah. last night, the way she was dismissing Kirsten Dunst. She didn't much like that. Yeah. I didn't think, 
That's what comedians do if mm-hmm. they take that gig. And so I, I just think that it's much different for a comedian to make a joke, a wealthy, famous comedian to make mm-hmm. a joke about the wealthiest, fam- most famous power couple potentially in Hollywood, certainly in that room. Mm-hmm. than it is for another black person to make a joke about you on the mm-hmm. street, much less a comment uh, or yeah. a white person like the setting and the context matter so much to me in this case, especially when it's the most famous and wealthiest mm-hmm. of entertainers. Did I make any good points in there? Should I text that to Rob? <laughs> I, I hear what you're saying. And, you know, the reason why this was so extra was because of Jada Pinkett's struggle with alopecia. Right. And and but the challenge is he didn't know we have it, to it, it is possible. And some people say that's nonsense. That, that That is true. And if you look at the history of some of the things Chris Rock has said about them, he has never said anything about that. You know, it's been about things about them having, you know, his, his ex-wife in their life and, and them boycotting the Oscars. So that is very possible. I, I get that. And But whether he did or not, one of the things you have to I, I agree with you on is that it's tough to be a comedian nowadays. Even when when things got really heavy with, with Me Too and comedians were scared to come to campus and so on and so forth. We've always given comedians a certain level of leeway in our society, whether it's right or wrong. And there's a lot of stuff that I've laughed at that Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle and other and Will Smith has rapped about or whatever or said, you know, about black people. That's really not funny. But we we do that and we've accepted that. And so in that line, I understand what you're saying as it relates to the comedy of it. And from what I understand, maybe you watch more of the videos than I have because I haven't seen this. Some say that Will Smith was actually laughing with Chris Rock until he looked at Jada and she wasn't laughing, and then that response came. I don't know. Things can get cut and redone. But if that's the case, then that speaks to an issue as well. And so I think that there is a space for comedy. And I feel like even with Chris Rock, what he said was out of pocket. Like you said, other people make out of pocket jokes all of the time. But there's nothing anybody can say on stage that warrants that type of response in front of everybody. Handle this stuff backstage. Have a conversation. You got a bigger platform than Chris Rock. You can go at him in so many other ways. Nothing justifies that. I couldn't agree more with that. Although I, the only thing I guess I would disagree with it. Yes, comedy has gotten a little harder. You have to be more careful, but I don't think it's been a, a burden. I think that it's always, I think it's easy. Mm-hmm. Don't punch down. And I don't yes. think Chris Rock was punching down. And I don't think he usually does punch down. I think Dave Chappelle punched down. I think plenty of white comedians punch down all the time. Well, let me ask you about, about punching down though, right? No. I agree with you about punching down. But I think we should have also have equal, not equal, but as much a lot of concern about punching across. Right. Because if you talk about a group that's marginalized, like with a lot of Dave Chappelle's comments. But I, we should have also issues with jokes that, you know, black comedians make about black women and other black people. I don't believe this idea. of It's OK as long as your people say it about each other, mm. as long as, you know, same thing with the music, with the length of things we listen to in the music. Yeah, there's things that that Nas can say that Eminem can't say. But, you know, Eminem came as Tina Loris Tucker and told her to suck a, you know, so on and so forth. I, Nobody said I, anything I, about that. And so I believe, yes, we have to target punching down. That's wrong. But I have issues with people who will take offense to what people Dave Chappelle might say about the trans community, which we should. I'm, a, I'm an ally to I'm a partner with the trans community. There's no doubt about it. And I stand with them, not as an ally, but with them as human beings. But I also want us to be upset when these comedians also go at black women, when they go at black men, when they talk about violence, when they talk about Ron sex and they talk about come give me a blowjob and all of that other type of stuff. Well, yeah, no, that should be a problem, too. It sounds like, though, what you're talking, what, at least most of the examples, I would be really curious and maybe we could do this the next episode. Like you can point to a clip and we could watch it together and we could unpack it. That would be an, an interesting thing to do with someone sure. like yourself. But you're talking what it sounds like you're talking about is black men still, though. Uh, punching down at at women, meaning yes. that that's still yes. you know gender men going after women, you yes. know is is still punching down. But if we're talking about white women and white women or black women and black women, I don't know. I love that because that's their ability or or, or mm-hmm. white men and white men. I certainly mm-hmm. engage in in making fun of white men all the time. So mm-hmm. I'd be interested in you sharing an example of the punching across. But I also think the. As much as we talk about anti-racism, I like to fa- consider myself also an anti-sexist. Mm-hmm. And you know, earlier you, you brought up hip hop. So much of, of of hip-hop music to me is unlistenable because of 
just the commentary, the misogyny. Mm-hmm. It's just so yeah. much objectification. Watching the Super Bowl halftime show, I was like, check, check, check. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I don't like 50 Cent. I don't mm-hmm. like him because of, you know, how he has objectified women so much. And I think he even been accused of doing some bad things. But I know he had a rough childhood, whatever, and anybody who's open to redemption. But like, I loved, you know, with the rest of them. But then, you know, you mentioned Eminem and the things that he said as well. So I don't know. I, I feel like anti-sexism, like we could talk about racism, but I, I think there's a conversation, obviously, that always needs to happen with men, uh, mm-hmm. men uh, about their about their sexism. I guess I don't end yeah. up a question on this one. No, no doubt. And I think that the language matters. And so even though I'm part of the anti-racist movement, I, I'm a language person. You know, Mother Teresa said, I'll never attend an anti-war rally, only a pro-peace peace rally. And mm. so I think that even our language needs to kind of step up a little bit. Are we, is there a difference between anti-racist and being pro-equity? There's a difference between being anti-sexist and being a feminist. And I think both of us would identify as feminists as it relates to we're out there fighting the fight for those rights. And so, you know, when, when, when we talk about, you know, some of the language with hip hop, hip hop goes as America goes. As America becomes more or less misogynistic, so does hip hop. As America becomes more or less homophobic, so does hip hop. Jay Z and Nas shared some of the most homophobic lyrics in hip hop history. A couple of years ago, Jay Z's rapping about Tom Ford and how he loves wearing the fashion gay designer Tom Ford's clothing and celebrating him. And then he's also talking about you know his mother, you know who who came out as being a lesbian. You right. know uh, uh, Eminem and and Elton John had their tension. Then you see them years later doing a song together. Mm-hmm. Hip hop goes as America goes. It's just a more of a public forum with the music, but it does what America does. So well said. Really a very important point. I love that. How about um, last week's confirmation hearings? What was your what was your overall reaction? Give any any take you want to the a the symbolic uh, the symbolism of the nomination of the first black woman. What that means to you and uh, and then, you know, how you how you thought it was handled last week. Look, I mean, the fact of the matter is that my children are going to be able to see someone who looks like them with hair like ours getting up there and being a Supreme Court justice. And having been a public defender, my 15 year old, my oldest child is talking about, she may want, she was talking earlier about wanting to possibly be a public defender before wow. this even happened. So just in terms of representation, it is beautiful. And the high point was just to see her parents, man. Every time I think about them and see their image, it brings almost a tear to my eye. So what she represents is just beautiful on every level. And the fact that children nowadays of all races are going to be able to say that we've had a black president, a black and Asian vice president, a Latina Supreme Court justice, now a black woman Supreme Court justice. There's so many things that they're not going to have to deal with that we all had to deal with that they're just not going to have to deal with. Having said that, it was Massage Noir uh, on full blast. So those who don't know what Massage Noir is, it's misogyny directly aimed at black women. I never have heard that term. That is awesome. Perfect. Yes. Wow. So, yeah. Okay. And it was on full display. These guys, the Lindsey Grahams of the world, you know, as, as Karen Hunter says, the Larry Lindsey Grahams of the world and the Ted Cruz's who had nothing to go against her because you can't target perfection. You can't do anything about it. All they can turn into was race baiting, making her seem as you know soft on child pornography, which is a type of slander, in my opinion. And it was disgraceful, but it was not surprising. And for all y'all in the comedic world, can one of you all please do a skit similar to Barack Obama and Keegan, uh, 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 you know, when they were at the correspondence dinner. Please do a skit where you show what Katanji really, Justice yeah. Katanji really wanted to say and do. I will pay to see that. That is a great idea. And I had a similar thought, not as so much of a, as a, as a comedy sketch, but like I just kept wanting her to slam her fist on the table and say, that is enough. Mm-hmm. None of you. None of you asking me about this have any have probably ever seen the images or dealt with the nightmares that I have dealt with. Right. None of you have, but she can't. She couldn't do that. She's not allowed to do that. Apparently, I mean, what would have happened had she called them out, called them to the mat on there? I mean, I I don't know. You she know, would have lost some Democratic votes who felt like she didn't have the temperament. People who are looking for a reason not to support her, and she would have lost her confirmation. And of course, we saw Brett Ka- Kavanaugh's meltdown, and people are comparing what happened to him. Look. This I was having an FBI investigation for sexual assault. There's no comparison here. He screamed. He screamed at them. What goes around comes around. Come on, man. You know he what I'm saying? The Democratic senators. He didn't say, you know, slam his fist down, say that's enough. Stop slandering me. He said he threatened them. That's right. That's right. He threatened them. A guy who's going to lifetime tenure on the court 
was like, I'm going to be in charge soon. You're going to get yours. I'm White male privilege on full blast. That's what yes. it was. And she didn't have it. And she conducted herself masterfully. Mm-hmm. So happy for her. Um, before I let you go, uh, your new book, which is out when? When does it come out? It's going to be out in, in the spring of, of 2023. I just signed this deal with Prometheus Books. It's called 10 Lies About Black People. And we're going to be exploring of how all of these racist ideas not only hurt Black America, but hurts the entire country. What does it mean when you say Black people can't swim? And, and how does that affect the country as it relates to how we're able to progress? What does it mean when you say that Black people are not good with money? And then all of a sudden you come up with housing policies that target us in terms of redlining and, and other issues relating to that. And how does that affect us economically as a society today? What does it mean when you say Black people are more prone to be criminals? And so you lock them up for crack cocaine, but you don't develop the health infrastructure that we needed at that time because it was addiction. So you have no help for the people suffering through the opioid epidemic because you didn't you didn't treat black people then. But now you're talking about therapy and help. If we had the infrastructure in place, we could have treated the opioid epidemic better. Those are the things that we're going to be looking at, how racism does, doesn't hurt black people. It affects our entire society. So please look forward to that. I am. In, in I, must I'm really looking forward to that one. You didn't mention, I don't know if it's in there, but the one that I find, I mean, all of these are pernicious and terrible stereotypes and negative in their lies. And, and, and some, some of them are in ways self-fulfilling because it's the system that creates a certain paradigm that prevents them from getting from getting an opportunity yes. that you're saying they don't do this. It's like, yeah, you literally took the opportunity right out from under them. But one thing um, I've always heard is about poverty in general, yes. uh, but that, that, that black folks are somehow lazy. They're mm-hmm. sitting around to me in many ways. That's the most pernicious because poverty is the hardest job in the world living in mm-hmm. poverty. You know this because you've talked very eloquently about this in your TED talk growing up mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. very poor, um, which is visceral the way that you describe your, your childhood and it's just what I always say to that is if you think that brown and black people are somehow lazy, mm-hmm. uh, ride public transportation during the middle of the night. And mm-hmm. all you'll see is black and brown people doing the hardest shift and the hardest often mm-hmm. kind of labor, physical labor in the mm-hmm. middle of the night. That mm-hmm. doesn't that's not I mean, it's just one of a billion just kind of data points or anecdotes you could use to prove that this is a pernicious myth. Anything about that kind of. Uh, horrible negative stereotype about a lack of motivation or laziness. Yes, absolutely. We are looking at that as well. People think that the majority of black people in this country are poor. It's more than 24 or 25 percent. But when we think about that idea that the majority of them are poor and lazy, when you think people are lazy, you're able to tar- you feel comfortable targeting them for anything. The reason more black and brown people suffered at the beginning of COVID was because of these issues relating to poverty. They were more on the front lines. This idea of black people are lazy denies people opportunities. And so when affirmative action comes up, people start saying, oh, these are handouts. When the fact of the matter is, as we both know, white women benefited more from affirmative action than any other group. So this idea of laziness we're at, and shiftlessness, which comes out of slavery and was used as justification to do terrible things to us during slavery, during slavery, we are absolutely going to talk about that, too. So I'm glad you brought that up. Awesome. 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 It is so great to talk to you. I'm really, really excited to to get the opportunity. And I, I look so forward to to doing this again, man. I, uh, yes. I can't thank you enough. And, and let's do it again anytime that you want. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. All right. Okay, there he goes. How about it? On Twitter, you can find at Omikongo, O-M-E-K-O-N-G-O, O-M-E-K-O-N-G-O, Dr. Omikongo Dabinja, or is it Dabinga? Now I forget. Oh, boy. Well, he was a great guest. I look forward to having him back on the show. I highly recommend you check out all the content that he's creating and his coursework at American University. Great speaker to hire to bring into your organization. UpstanderInternational.com is the website you can find him on as well. Let him know that you heard him here as well as Stephen Greenhouse. Happy birthday to Pete Coe. Thank you to John Carroll for the music, DJ Monzak for the website and the logo, and everybody who contributes at least $5, and some of you so much more than that each and every month. If you haven't signed up for a paid subscription, maybe today's your day. Certainly would make my day to see new subscriptions come in because that's the only way to sustain doing this work, which I love so much here in the shed. But it's time to put this baby to bed and Indy the dog as well. Thank you for listening today, and I will talk Talk to you right here tomorrow. Be the change you want to see. Love you guys. That's right. You got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eyes. You got to let him know it's his turn to go. See it clear when all you hear is a lie. Don't get up off of your butt. Get down off of your fence. Even if it ain't a very friendly audience. Start making